Welcome to another episode of Talking with Kevin and Son. You know this show is all about people you should know. This episode is brought to you by RMK Productions and the 10 United Podcast Network. Our mission is through the power of story, is to uplift, share our voices, inspire, share stories and experiences and perspectives using the framework of teaching, learning, and modeling. Our purpose is hope, helping other people every single day. Now, ladies and gentlemen, um, I brought you many, many, many stories and introduced you to a lot of people, but this is someone that everyone should know. He is probably one of the best kept secrets outside of Lake Placid, New York in the Golden Arrow Hotel. Um, this is someone that you will play this um, podcast over and over and over again, because we're going to tell you some truths about life, happiness, and business. My guest is a co-founder of Bridge, Bridges Inter, uh, Investments. It is a large real estate investment group based out of Salt Lake City, Utah, managing over $10 billion in assets. My guest is known around the world for his philanthropy and his charitable contributions. His bio reads like a who's who, but he is dedicated to making a difference in the world. Matter of fact, he is focusing on being the change in children's lives throughout the world. He is a serial entrepreneur, successful with 15 businesses um, that he has created today. You will learn from the mouth of an expert the roadmap to achieve, achieving happiness and success. And if you stick around long enough, my guest will share with you a plan on how he plans on being the change this world needs to see. Ladies and gentlemen, um, Mr. Paul Hutchison, my guest, my friend, a true humanitarian. Welcome, Paul, to Talking Wit, Kevin and Son. Thank you, Kevin. Super grateful for the opportunity to share with uh, with you and your audience some of these beautiful truths I have found in this this journey called life. That's all right. So, Paul, you know, I, I I've met a lot of um, people throughout my life: presidents, NBA players, NFL players, and NBA women, this, that, and, and so forth. But the one thing is, you know, we can Google anything about you and know. Uh, exactly what you do, who you are, what your net worth is, and who the first wife is, second wife was, and so forth. But the one thing that we can't find is who made the man. I know the example of the first man that's in any man's life is his father. The first woman he learns to love is his mother. I want to take you back just a little bit and tell me the gifts that you got from your parents. Tell me a little bit about your parents, Paul. Uh, my parents are wonderful, wonderful human beings. They, uh, my mother uh, grew up with a whole bunch of siblings in a very, very small town. And her, her mother fell very, very sick when she was about 12 years old. And there was no hospitals in her town for her uh, to her to recover. And so my grandfather went with her to the big city. Back then it was Salt Lake and it was many hours away. And my mother at 12 years old was left to raise these five, six younger, five younger siblings at the time uh, for about six months on her own. And uh, it taught her um, and she 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 had a challenging time. But uh, from there, she learned to love. She learned to lead. Uh, my father um, came from a, a, a bloodline of royalty. His mother was a steward, a steward of England and whatnot. If, but there was a coup back in the 1600s. So there was, we, we didn't have any royalty there, but, but, but it's beautiful because the, those relatives and that heritage goes all the way back to people like, like William Wallace is a direct relative. And uh, um, that in the, the movie, uh, um, uh, Braveheart, et cetera, and, and uh, some some great leaders and some leaders who had some challenges. Um, but my parents themselves, the, the most beautiful uh, counsel that my father ever gave me was when I was about 14 years old. And I so badly wanted to be popular in school. I had buck teeth. I had braces. I had, um, and, and I asked him, I said, dad, how how do you make friends and and how how do you become successful what what does that look like and and um we had a number of conversations about what that looked like and treating every other human being as an equal and loving them for who they are not for what they have not from where they're from 
And, uh, and then he gave me a book by Dale Carnegie, How to Win Friends and Influence People. And this is, you know, people joke about the title saying, you know, this is how to, how to manipulate people. It's really not. It's about looking at every other person and understanding that their life is important to them. And, and a drop of honey is more, is going to attract more flies than a gallon of gall type of thing like that. And, and living from a place of the heart. And then the audio program he gave me was Brian Tracy's Psychology of Achievement. And that laid the foundation for me understanding that it wasn't just my actions that created value in the world, but my words and even my thoughts could create a world of abundance or a world of scarcity, a world of fear or a world of love. And, and by changing the negative thought patterns I had about myself, when I looked in the mirror, instead of seeing a boy with with uh, buck teeth and braces, I could see myself as as somebody with a good heart who loved people, who 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 worked hard to make a positive impact in the lives of others and worked hard to create value to the world around me. And as I saw that and I started changing how I saw myself, then I indeed was able to start transforming the world around me in not only what I attracted. They talk about the law of attraction. It's in reality the law of creation. It's 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 this beautiful life that that unfortunately we are held back with these perceptions of ourself. And by breaking free of those, I was able to have a, a beautiful uh life of um of expansion that I wasn't able to have when I didn't understand those principles. So those were some beautiful gifts that my parents gave me. Um I grew up in a very religious home. Um I have a uh, I'm not tied to any religion now. I'm I have a I have a beautiful relationship with my creator. Um and 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 I follow uh, that light of truth, that intuition that all of us has to help guide my life in a way that brings about prosperity for myself and others and brings about love for my family and expands it out to others, et cetera. So those were some beautiful truths I got from my parents early on. Now, what did your father do for a living while you were growing up? So he was in, uh, he, he was in sales in a concrete company and, uh, and, and, he worked very hard, um, traveled a lot in, in sales for his concrete company. And then he, he uh, somewhere in around 16, 17 years old, we had a sit down as a family. And he said, guys, he said, just so you know, either next week I'm going to be out of a job or we're going to be on the path to even a, a healthier lifestyle. And, um, and so that uh, he, he was making a bid to take over his company and, and that's what he ended up doing. He ended up buying out some of the, the other principals and, and being a business owner. And, um, and that was, that was absolutely a transformational time because it was scary for us as a family, but he, he took that leap of faith and, uh, and put in the bid to start buying out the, the partners in the company. What was your first job with, with, with your dad? And the reason why I'm asking this, because um, our stories are so much uh, alike, um, first jobs and so forth. So I kind of know some of the answers to the questions that um, I, I'm asking. Mm -hmm. what, what was your first job? Was it with dad or was it your, your paper route? No, actually, it was kind of with dad, but it was very, very young. So when we were really young, we we didn't have um, we didn't have a lot of money. And my dad and mom had took on a second side business uh, cleaning um companies they they clean the bank that was down the street and so we would get up with them at about 4 a.m 5 a.m and we would go and empty garbages and help vacuum the floor and we were just kids i mean i was eight nine years old and then we got a bigger bigger job uh cleaning this this the the real estate um realtor's office it was like a three-story building and now it was me and my sisters and my mom and dad we were in there before my dad even went into work and um and i remember pulling the they they had like this 
this this big printer that had a bunch of aluminum things that they were using as, that would throw them away. And I remember pulling those out of the garbage can so that we could turn them in with our pop cans so that we could get enough money so that we could go to Disneyland that year and um, just collecting the pop cans and stuff. And it was it was it was character building work. And um, that's that was a very young age. That's what we were doing is working, helping stuff with that. And I I started my my first company because I was so excited about running a company. And I I actually had a, a worm selling company when I was eight. I I I found out that if I watered the lawn really good, that that the worms, the big night crawlers would come up, and I could collect them, and I could go out on the street because there was a a. a a river that fishermen did just down. And so I could go out there and as they were driving by, I had a little stand, I would sell in the worms. And, and I was like a dollar a dozen, but that was a lot of money. I was a little kid. And, and, uh, and every dollar that I earned, I would either go buy some donuts with it, which were like 15 cents a dozen, or if I wanted to spend a whole dollar, I could buy a Hot Wheels car. You know, I get like these cool trucks, <laughs> this little collection of Hot Wheels cars that I got from selling worms. And then my dad, he uh, he said, Paul, he said, there's a there's a way that you could get the worms out better than just watering it like that. I said, wow, what, what do I do? And he came up with this little tool. It was a it was a steel. Um, he, he put this thing into like a steel horseshoe, and he he wrapped half of a of a electric wire around it and put tape on it, black you know electrical tape, so I wouldn't shock myself. And he told me to pound that into the ground and then plug it in. And it sent this electrical current and all the night crawlers came up and I was like, Oh, I'm rich. And then I would go around to the neighbors and said, Hey, I'd like to um, get all the extra worms out of your yard. And I'd plug it in all their night. So I have all of these worms. And so then I could get lots of hot wheels cars. <laughs> it, it, it's, it's amazing when I, when I say, and I told this to your assistant, our stories uh, line up. If literally you, you put a sheet of paper, a transfer paper over your story, I will tell you that, and it's hard to believe that my grandmother was an entrepreneur. She was doing house cleaning. And as eight and nine years old, I went with her itself. When I was living, we lived in a cul-de-sac in Dayton, Ohio, 710 Shoop, that I started cutting uh, grass because I realized that the seasons change or whatever. And we didn't have a lot of money either, just like your parents. And before long, I had all the houses. There were eight houses in the cul-de-sac that I had all the eight, eight houses. And I did snow removal, lease removal, cut the grass and whatever. And when my buds found out what I was doing and what I was making money, what happened was I, uh, my grandfather put together a, a second lawnmower and I rented it out to my neighbors. I still collected to $25 and I paid each one of my friends um, $5 to do the job. And all I did was supervise this. So your father introduced you without saying to entrepreneurship and you were open to collectively d developing your own business. That's an amazing story at 16, 17 years of age. Um, yeah, that, was, that was eight or nine. And then by the time I was 12, 13, 14, I, I had like you, I had a lawn mowing thing. I went around with the, with our lawnmower after I did my chores at home and, and uh, knocked on the neighbor's doors and seen if I can mow their lawns for them. So exactly the same path. Paul, well, I, I have a, a personal question. You play sports in school. Were you popular with the girls? Cause you're a good looking guy. No, I, I was, I, I actually, I mean, I was okay, but I, because I had really bad buck teeth and braces and stuff, I had low self-esteem early on. Um, I did play, I did play rugby. Um, I, I played football for just, a, a, just the summer season and stuff. And then I ended up playing some rugby. I was pretty smart. I was, I was, I was after I kind of overcame some of my self-esteem issues, I decided to run for office and I lost so many times. I lost in, in, uh, running for like five different offices in junior high and high school. But then in, in 11th grade, I ran for student body vice president which was a big deal because we had a pretty big school and, um, and I lost, they, they told me I lost by four votes and there was thousands of kids at our school. They recounted it multiple times, but the, the principal came to me after the, the loss. And he said, Paul, we actually were rooting for you because we, we believe you can bring people together. 
Uh, and we we have watched you. You're really popular with the smart kids because I was in all the AP classes and uh, the college classes that were in high school. He said you're popular with the, the sports kids because of some of the things you played. You're you're back then. We had the the punkers, the rockers, and the wavers. You know, we had totally different that were kind of fighting against each other. But I had friends on all of those sides, and so he recruited me to lead something, start something called the peer leadership team which brought together people of different cultures and people of different, you know, mindsets and stuff and, and had activities and, and helped kids with, with uh, drug and alcohol abuse and, and created a counseling program for children who were suicidal or who had home issues and stuff like that. And so it was a blessing that I didn't win that student body office because I was able to do so much more good in the, in really getting down to helping these these peers, these kids with with important things in their lives, not just being student body president, vice president. So that's, that's all right. Yeah. Um, being a young entrepreneur and being academic the way that you were, you were probably sought after by um, some of the top schools throughout out the country. You you sound like you're well educated not only in life, but um, in the literal sense, as far as academia and, and so forth. Um, did you start your business while you're in school, your first business in school? No. And uh, where'd you graduate? Well, in the, on the contrary, I'm actually, um, number one, I worked my butt off for my grades, but, um, but I didn't get a scholarship. Um, I, I had like a three point, I don't remember what it was, maybe a three eight or whatever, but I, maybe I just didn't fill out enough paperwork or whatever, but I didn't get a scholarship. I went to the university of Utah and the, my, my goal was actually to be a doctor. I wanted to be, since I was 10 years old, um, I, I was trying to decide between business and medicine. And my dad told me, you're not going to be very good at business. And I said, why? He said, because you're not very good at kissing butt. He said, he said, you know, you're, you're not very good with authority. And, and in his world, you know, he started at the bottom and worked his way up and you had to kiss butt. And so we never really talked about it being an entrepreneur. And he said, you're a smart kid. Uh, let's look at things in business. And so I decided at a young age, I wanted to be a, a doctor, a pediatric cardiologist, not a regular doctor, but a surgeon, not a regular surgeon, but a heart surgeon. And not a regular heart surgeon, but a heart surgeon that helps children. And fast forward, now that I'm I'm a philanthropist, I really believe that my words and my actions and the charities I work with are still being a heart surgeon on children, a heart doctor. And it's not just for the children. I believe that my role is to help heal the heart of, uh, of the 10-year-old inside of every 30, 40, 50-year-old man or woman. And we can talk about that later, but but being that that passion for really helping people and changing their hearts. But but what happened is the reason why that changed. I was two months away from taking the MCAT. I was going to the University of Utah, and um, take I had taken a lot of my medical pre med classes in high school, the college stuff, and I came and I was I had done a couple of year service mission, and then came back and was ready to take the MCAT, and I got in a major car accident. And I severed all the tendons in my hand. And I still have I-80 in, in my hand 20, mm -hmm. 25 years later. And they at the time it was a it was a mess. And they didn't know if I'd even have the dexterity to be a surgeon. And what's sad, Kevin, is I had spent 15 years uh in intense piano study. I was, I was almost a concert pianist. I was earning money teaching piano and playing at concerts and stuff. And in one second, I wasn't able to play the piano and they didn't know if what I'd been working for my entire life, if I could do that. And, and the surgeon said, Paul, I don't know if you'll have the dexterity to be a surgeon after we're done with this. He said, you could, you could be a regular doctor. And my, my answer was this. I said, I don't want to be a regular anything. I, I, I didn't want to be a doctor. I want to be a surgeon and a heart surgeon. I got one life to live. I'm going to make an impact. And, and um, I, I told him this, I said, if I'm going to be a garbage man, I'm going to own the dump. That's just how I think, you know, I, I, I want to make an impact and I want to, and, and, and I, and so 
I had a, there was, I was introduced to a guy, kind of a friend of the family who was pretty successful in business. Paul, do me, do me one favor. Cause I, I want to do an original interview because this sounds a lot like the interview that we've done before. Absolutely. I want to pull back a little bit. I want my viewers to know you I got a different audience. Um, okay. One of the things you, you said, you read a book called um, how to win friends and influence people. You mm-hmm. how many brothers and sisters do you have? Uh, four sisters. Four, four sisters. So you're the only only boy. Poor thing. You never got a chance to use the bathroom. <laughs> exactly. Um, I I, I, I want to know that book. How did it impact your relationship with your um, your family members and your friends? Um, and then we'll we'll start to go, come over and and talk about you know how to build uh, happiness and um, talk about su- what success means. Absolutely. Let me pull Absolutely. you back a little bit. Well. What changed is I I came to understand that every single person that I talk to is a thousand times more interested in themselves than they are me. You know, we we come across thinking the whole world's about us, especially growing up. We we don't know where to, you know, how to how to place ourselves. And and um and I, I came to understand that. If I could truly put myself in their shoes, if I could imagine what it was like to be them, to be the 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 middle sibling instead of me being the oldest, being you know my my sister, uh, one sister was dyslexic. If I could really put myself in her shoes and understand how that would affect her ability to really learn at school and read and things like that. I, I, I changed simply how I saw every other person and it wasn't about me and that I could have deep relationships with people by, by paying attention to them, by paying attention to what words were, were coming out of their mouth and the feelings that they have and truly see things and life from their perspective that changed everything for me. I I started feeling compassion for my mom for having to that massive responsibility when she was a kid. And the fact that she's now kind of over raising kids. So she kind of let us do whatever. And for my dad being the middle child and having a mother that that I believe really never knew how to love. I I I for years was upset that my dad never said the words I love you and and never really hugged me and i i thought wow why i mean he taught me beautiful principles but was missing that and but but then once how I, did that make you feel when your father never told you he loved you we have the same story yeah i i i i knew he loved me because his love language was acts of service and he would do it all the time and he would never yell at me and he never hit me and there was never he he created a safe environment but I realized that he didn't have the ability and I, it hurt. It hurt the the very first time I actually heard the words. I love Paul. The very first time I was 19 years old, getting ready to leave on a two year service mission. And we were, he was speaking to a group and telling them, I want Paul to know that I love him. And he wasn't even directly at me. And, and I thought, wow, that's, that was the first time. And it, and but today, you know, he hugs me all the time and loves me all the time because I was able to show that to him. I kind of forced him through it by hugging him through it and just saying, Dad, I love you every time we met. But yeah, it it did affect me. My mom said I loved you all the time and I knew my dad loved me, but it it for every kid, there's there's something inside this like, am I not good enough? Is there things I need to do to earn that love? And, and I want, I want to help everybody, everybody feel that they don't have to look outside themselves to be worth something, to be valued. Who, who, who was the first person that you loved and how old were you at that time? And why did you love them? I loved my sisters. I'm telling which, you what, which one, which one was your favorite? Well, Kathy? Tiffany, Tiffany was the closest. She's the oldest. And, uh, and then, uh, then there was Angela. So she was the third. And when we were kids, we, I mean, those girls loved me. I loved them. I would, I would 
you know, I'd beat up anybody that tried to hurt them in any way. And uh, we we had this, we, we decided we wanted to be a, a singing family. We had all these songs that we would sing and we didn't have, you know, our vacations, we would be in the back of the pickup truck. My parents would be up front with the windows closed. My dad put a shell over the back and we would spend eight hours sitting in the back of this pickup truck on this carpet singing songs. And we were the the PTA kids, Paul, Tiffany, Angela. And then Amy came along. So then we're like the PTAA kids. That didn't sound right. And then Alicia came along, PTAAE. So we had to, we, we, we watched that, but, but, um, but yeah, my, my, my sisters, we we're super close, beautiful, beautiful relationship growing up. And who was the first person that broke your heart? Hmm. Broke my heart. I had a lot of, when I was in first grade, I had a girlfriend and it was super special because the, the teacher thought it was so cute. Even in the, in the, in the pictures of our first grade class, it was me and her, her name was Vanessa. And we were, we were so close all the time. I would walk her home and she lived, I lived right across the street from the school. She, she lived as far away as you could get from the school. And I would walk her all the way home every day. And, and I would, I would give her my, my, my graham crackers and milk if she wanted it during the little, you know, in first grade. And, uh, and that was in kindergarten and first grade. And then, uh, and then her parents decided to move to Tennessee and that broke my heart because I had, and I didn't really have a girlfriend for years after that was beautiful as she ended up becoming a, an, an NFL cheerleader. And I ended up marrying a girl. And that's a whole other story we can talk about we, we, later. We are going to talk about that later on. But but I, I'm but getting to this. Um, I'm married to somebody named Vanessa. I, I knew it in first grade. I was going to be with somebody named Vanessa. So here I am. And, and my my first kiss was Vanessa Birdsong. Like I told you, our lives are, are, are <laughs> intertwined. Um, um, the reason why I want to ask this is in the way I want my guests to get to know you. All right. Yeah. Because a successful businessman, we have have a tendency to recant our, our successes at the same time. We're trying to get to know who we are and we uh, and we talk about our businesses and our successes. And that's not who we are as I love people, it. As, <laughs> as people. If I were to ask your what's your oldest son's name? Uh, jo- well, I have twins, Jordan and Jaden. Jaden is two minutes older than Jordan. If, if, if I would ask uh, Jaden and Jordan right now. What what is your one favorite thing? What would your son say? Your phone? What was what, what is my favorite thing? Yeah, what is your one favorite thing that dad likes to do? Listen to audio programs on leadership and success. It's funny. They they one of them told me, Dad, the only reason you like 80s music is that's the last thing you ever heard. <laughs> Because <laughs> because I I will be in the cars and I'll be I'll be so excited about the new Tony Robbins thing or whatever else and and uh, we I, I ended up buying years ago I bought LeBron James's Range Rover from him mm-hmm. and I, I mean this thing had eighty thousand dollars worth of you know, sixty thousand dollars subwoofers in the back with all this other stuff and my kids joked and said Dad what are you gonna do listening to your motivational audio things on your $60,000 subwoofers. So th- they would probably say that that would be uh, a, a valuable thing is that ability to, to gain knowledge from others. From a thing standpoint, um, I've, I've really tried to not be attached to things. Even this house, I, I, my, my ex-wife wanted to buy this house and I was like, ah, I'm not interested. I'm really not. The only way I'm interested in a home like that is if we can use it for for charity events and things like that, that we can bring good people together. And so, you know, that's that's uh, from a thing standpoint, I I I, I really am not attached. Um, you, but but how, not how, how old are your your twins right now? They're 27. If I were to ask them the the one memory that they have that they shared with with their dad, what memory would that be? Hmm. Maybe our uh, we had a beautiful trip to Hawaii that we were going to go for a week, and we ended up just staying for weeks and weeks, and and uh, it was you know, it was it was beautiful and connecting and 
And uh, it was it was a vacation of a lifetime when when we didn't have enough money for a vacation like that. But, you know, I sacrificed and stayed and and it was it was it was a beautiful time with them. All right. All right. So the the reason why I'm asking this is because the, the one thing that um, I hear constantly in my space is what people are going to do, what they want to do, and they don't have time to do it. And if I had time, I would like to do it. And part of the conversation always said that same, the same 60 seconds um, here in the United States is the same 60 seconds um, in China or you name it anyplace else. It's what you do with your time. When I was asked the same question with uh, my children, it was a um, eye opening. And they said, the one thing that I would like with my dad is more time. And I was trying to see where we went from that. Um, what does time mean to you? How do you value your time? Well, time is the uh, number one. We all we all heard it so so many times that time is the one thing you don't get back. Um, I I think that unfortunately we box ourselves into this time paradigm, the thinking in uh, in finite terms of money and finite terms of 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 time and finite terms of relationships and 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 job opportunities and everything we think so finite and in in changing that perspective and realizing that that um that there is so much more than what we understand and that's a whole different conversation about what comes beyond this but for this life i I believe you can't you can't kill time without injuring eternity. You can't, you know, wasting a minute is now what you have to understand is that that define wasting. You know, you can't be running full time. Balance is so important. And you know, last night um we we uh uh we had a uh you know, after church we had some time as a family and my daughter wanted to do this this yoga thing as the family. And we all kind of went down in the gym and we, we all were doing this yoga and it was beautiful. And then he, she did this sound bath audio. And at first I was thinking, okay, what do I got to do now? What do I got to do now? What do I got to do now? And I realized this is the best use of my time right now. I'm not doing anything productive. I'm laying here on a mat, listening to this, this, the, the sound bowl music here with the family. And, you know, years ago, my uh my first wife um she she jokes all the time she says she said let me tell you about paul and time she said one time she said she was she was sitting in in bed and she was reading and i was i was asleep because i had a long hard day and she said paul stood sat up in bed and said what's the best use of my time right now what, what's the best use of my time right now and then he said sleeping and he lay back down <laughs> and so <laughs> So, so yes, ask yourself, what's the best use of my time right now? But understand that the best use of your time right now might be something completely unproductive that is healing to the soul, that is connecting with other people, that is resting your body and your soul. And so I've changed that perspective of what's the best thing you use of my time and just hit, 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 hit it hard to understanding that balance is super valuable. Yes, <clears throat> that was beautifully said. Well said. We, we, in our, during our icebreaker conversation, we both said that we have little statements um, that are in our office or during the, our, in our house that reminds us of things that trigger us to, to stay on point. In my office, there's a pillow that reads, there are two destroyers of dreams, procrastination, giving up on yourself. During the icebreaker con conversation, you meant you mentioned um, there were two worst enemies to success. Do you remember what those were? The worst enemies to success? Mm-hmm. I'm trying to remember what I said on that. Um, I remember my my mission statement that's yeah. on my my office. You said self um, self discipline is the key to success, and the lack of self discipline is the cause of most people's failures. Yeah, yeah. There's, and and you have to ask yourself what that discipline is. You know, um, unfortunately, some people think that self discipline is driving, 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 and success, success, success. But sometimes self discipline 
is in is in turning off the cell phone and turning off the computer to spend that special time with your family. Sometimes people think that self-discipline is is what is the most productive thing. But really what it is, is asking yourself, what are the most valuable things in your life? And, and what kind of things do I need to do between here and there to ensure that those things are taken care of? Those relationships with your family and that, that inner peace and health in your body, you know, is, is self-discipline working a 15, 16 hour day and forgetting to eat and grabbing a, a, a Big Mac and a Slurpee on the way home? No. Self-discipline might be slowing down and making sure that you're feeding your body something that is that is healthy and and for your soul and your and your body itself. And so so yes, that's a that's a super powerful thing, self-discipline, but it needs to be in line with what is really important. If that makes sense, that makes a lot of sense. And and you that was well spoken. You you put words together pretty good. If I put music to that, I can probably win a Grammy with that. Let it go. <laughs> hey, Paul, you know, when I talk about roadmap to achieving achieving uh, happiness and success, we have to define on what happiness is. Um, for everyone, it's different. Um, sometimes, I mean, you know, like every emotion, uh, every quote, you know, people think they're strong words, they're emotion. Happiness is an emotion. Um, how do you define ha- happiness and how does happiness cross over to success? Absolutely. So I really came to understand the principle of happiness in my 20s. I had a had a company that helped people overcome anxiety and depression disorders. And uh, uh, I spoke with, I estimate somewhere around 20,000 people from the time I was 21 years old until I was 29 and sold the company um, and that that had anxiety and depression to the point where it was debilitating, where they couldn't work a normal job and they couldn't be the mother or father they wanted to be. And they really weren't happy. They weren't happy. And what was interesting is these people ranged from ultra wealthy to completely broke. They were they were so you know, thin and fat, they were every, every culture, every, every type of person, there, there wasn't anything, one type of person, rich or poor, whatever, that, that had it. It was tied to, in most cases, the perceptions they had of themselves, that the, when they look in the mirror and that man or woman that they see, and the trauma that they choose to hold on to or let go of, and the goals that they have and the progress they were making. And I came to understand that that in most cases, happiness came from two things. Number one, personal growth and personal progression. And the other one was helping other people progress. And, and, and they were stuck because of their negative habit patterns of thought, because of their perceptions of themselves, because they weren't growing in some way. If we could help them change what they saw when they looked in the mirror, the, the, what they said to themselves over and over again, if we could help them change that and help them break free of that just roadblock that was preventing them to grow and help them set new goals, whatever they were, if they were started to get in better shape physically or building a new relationship or or doing something in their job, you look back at your life, the times where you're stuck and you're beating yourself up for things are, are pull away from that happiness. Yet when you're growing in some way, whatever it is, you're progressing and growing in some way, there's happiness that comes from that. And then you ask people, you know, what was your greatest joy this last year? A lot of times it was helping somebody else progress. It was when my my son took his first steps or my daughter was in that recital and, and played that piece, whatever it was, seeing and helping another person progress creates happiness as well. So people are searching for happiness in all the wrong areas. They, people will search in, in the, the money side. Well, when I, when I have this much, you know, I'm, I'm going to be happy. No, it's the journey. 
It's the progress on the way. It's not when you, oh, wow, I have this big check now and I buy this new car, but it's that it's the journey along the way because it's personal progression and helping others progress that create that happiness. Well, you, you're like Tony Robinson. You're dropping a lot of nuggets, as they would say in, in my neighborhood. Um, before we go on to the second half of um, this podcast, how do people get in touch with you? And the other thing is, do you have a book out of something someone can acquire on How to Be Successful by Paul Hutchison? <laughs> I don't yet. I don't yet, but I'm writing a couple that will be coming out. I, I have one that I believe is tied to charity, happiness, success, and everything. And it's all about listening to your heart and really tuning in to that, getting out of your head and all the logic and all the crap that you've been saying to yourself, but understanding that every one of us were born with this ability to feel and recognize truth and and to learn how to to listen to that to guide you through some beautiful things so that'll be coming out in the next few months um they to get in touch with me um you can go to paulhutchinsonofficial.com or look at me online if that's too long to to write out go online and type in www.soulhealer007 because of my undercover work <laughs> soulhealer007.com will will link you right into my my Facebook page and everything else soulhealer007 or you can just look me up under Paul Hutchinson official and and I'm I I've now opened up social media I I we were talking earlier I've been I've been off all of those things for the last 10 years I still had a, a LinkedIn and stuff but I was doing some charity work some undercover work and helping to to rescue uh children um you know that's a that's a whole other podcast a whole different conversation but um uh, because of that I didn't have anything public and people told me for a long time Paul you need to write a book you need to go public and I I couldn't in fact I was uh I was in a conversation with with you brought him up with Tony Robbins and Tony had seen one of the the rescue missions and uh, about six seven years ago and he told me he said Paul he said the world needs to hear your stories but while you're doing undercover work the world can't know who you are and so you know here we are six years later and deciding okay now it's time it's time to share these stories of light and love and hope and true success in a way that I believe I can help people heal from the inside out so that we can we can fix problems like that and other other bigger issues within families in a way where we can heal the heart and then heal the world. And and to my listeners, um, there's a reason why Paul Hutchison is on Talking With Kevin and Son. There's the reason why I have not asked the staple question, give me five um, key points in order to, to build a successful business. Um, and the reason why I'm not asking those questions, because if Think and Grow Rich really made a lot of people rich, everyone that's read the book would be a lot richer today than they were when they first purchased the book, um, because action is, is what it's all about. Um, I, I have a podcast every Sunday. It's called Motiv Motivational Sundays with Kevin and Friends. We throw out quotes. One of the quotes that uh, had... Um, land it with me and i want to see what you think it says your success in, in life depends on more of the person that you become than the things that you do or acquire it's by aristotle um what is your interpretation and perception based on that quote well that is kevin that is everything right there everything and i can i can say from experience and uh, you know a little Correction on the intro, the fund's actually over 40 billion, not 10, but I didn't build it to that. I, I give all the glory to the to God and the people that are still running it, et cetera. But that created a situation in me where years ago I wasn't Paul Hutchinson. I was Paul F. And Hutchinson. And that ego and that negative energy created difficult relationships and animosity and 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 it was unhealthy in every way and it wasn't until i came to uh, uh, a very close connection with my savior with my creator in a way where i could bring my life into alignment 
I am a hundred times happier today than I ever was. And this house, we're, we decided after arriving to that point, we're selling it. We're getting rid of all of the bling and the crap that, you know, made me feel all important and, and have senators and attorneys and, and celebrities and NBA players over here for parties. No, that's not what it's about. And, and the being able to, to get my life on center and get to a place where I could lead from the heart. I could teach from the heart. I could inspire truly from the heart, not from a position of look at me, look at me, here's where I am, but but come to a place where I can give it all away and be just as good with myself as if I could write a big check or I have a big house or anything like that. So so becoming that person of integrity, becoming and understand there's only one person that's ever lived that was perfect. And that ain't me. And that ain't you. So all of us have room to grow. I agree. And if we, if we hold on to all that crap of our past and we, we aren't able to get to a place of true Christ-like love for ourselves and, and letting go of judgment of other people and of ourselves, of realizing that man that was out of integrity is not the man that I am today. I can let that go and I can step into this new place of light that it is, it is liberating and so much more fulfilling than all the money in the world. Let, let me ask you a question, Paul. All right. Sure. Does, um, a matter of fact, I just want to tell you, I'm going to correct Google. Google said it's 43 billion. So you said 40 billion. So whoever's whoever's 40. updating your 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 history needs to be checked, edited. <laughs> um, every single successful person I've ever spoke to, I would say 90 percent, not every, um, has been in a dark place, has basically hit rock bottom before they became the man or woman that they are. Um share with us your darkest hour where did you fail um because i had put so much focus on business and success and what that looked like um i had two failed marriages and I joke many times and for, for the last 10 years. And I, I tell people, yeah, someday I'm going to write three books, one on building a big company and that'll be a bestseller and one on, on philanthropy and that'll be a bestseller. But my, my, uh, my book I write on my relationships with women in my life is how the hell do I get off the short bus? Because I was, I was making just bad decisions so many times my entire life was filled with with frustration when it came to my personal life and and my transformation came actually at a Tony Robbins event I was I was there a big you know uh 15,000 people there and and he has this part where he he has you identify something in your business that is not where you want to be and you visualize it and he takes you there emotionally back away. And I thought, you know what? I've done this to build companies. I've done this to, I've used this principle of writing down exactly what I want and seeing it and feeling it. I never did that in my personal life. And I spent the next two hours writing down all the details of the woman in my life, how the woman in my life shows up for me and how I show up for her and, and our relationship with God and, and, and how I show up for her children. And the, all of these things that this energetic connection is beautiful. And what's amazing is that that everything that I wrote down in less than two months came into my life because I had asked for what I wanted and I shed all of that crap all of that ego, all of that pride, all of those things that really didn't qualify me for having a healthy relationship. And I was able to let that all go once I clearly defined what it is that I wanted and wrote it down. I joke with Vanessa all the time. I tell her, I created you. <laughs> I wrote down all of these things that was a healthy relationship and 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 what that looked like and that and the man that I needed to be 
to qualify for that relationship. So that was that was the bottom of the barrel for me. That was that was the despair is I'm two failed marriages. I mean, do I even try again? And um, um, but it took taking a hard look at myself and asking myself why. And that's the, the the question itself and leading into the next couple of questions I have to ask you, and we'll wrap this up shortly, but we've got a lot of good stuff coming up for um, um, everyone here. Good friend of mine, Carl Eller, wrote a book, Without Character, You Have Nothing. Does, does that resonate with you? What does character mean? Absolutely. Yeah. Character, character I see is number one, it's it's how I genuinely see other people, not just the talking. Yeah, yeah, good, you know, I'll give you a hug. You did a great job. But how from my heart, deep down inside, how I feel about my fellow man, about every single person that I meet. Is there judgment there? Is there pride in me thinking I'm better than them in any way? That, that kind of energy is out of character and is out of integrity. And integrity I see is tied to character. Integrity is is doing the right thing even when nobody would ever know that you didn't do the right thing. That's what true integrity is. And that takes true character. And 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 sometimes character comes from the hardest times in our life. People say, oh, I'd love to live a life with no, with no pain, with no, no challenges. And you know what? The greatest character building experiences are the difficult times in our lives that, that help us realize, you know what? No, I can do this. I can get through this. I can, I can withstand this and I can do it in a way where I'm not blaming and I'm not pushing that negative on other people. And I'm taking that responsibility and I'm loving people for who they are. All of these things are things that come from the challenges. Yeah, you, you speak so well. I, I, I got to get a job like you. Um, do you believe the first measure of success is conquering yourself? Absolutely. Absolutely. But it's not, it's, I would say, I would change the words, Kevin, from conquering Please yourself to, to truly loving yourself with unconditional love and, and, and letting go of everything that doesn't serve the man of integrity, the man of character, the man of success that you want or woman in moving forward. And so, so it's not beating into submission that past version of me. Instead, it's letting it go, just releasing it, allowing God to cleanse that and embracing a light and a love and a transformation of where I want to be. That's, that's what it's about. Not not conquering, but but accepting this new version and seeing it and believing it from deep inside this new version of yourself and embracing this this vision of who you want to be and seeing it as it is today, shaving that millionaire even before you're not one in the mirror and seeing that good father who's and and that good husband and wife who is loyal in this relationship and 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 has integrity in every business deal and every action, seeing that, embracing that and simply letting go of that person that is not you today. In my business they talk about the 80-20 rule, that 20% of people produce 80% of what we enjoy in life. And then everyone else just kind of adds to it. Is success predictable? I would say so. I, uh, But you have to define success. There um, you go. <laughs> you know, you know, you're saying, is it predictable that this person is going to become a billionaire? You know what? Here's the thing. I believe it's predictable if you could really get inside of, of what's going on inside of here, inside their mind and inside their heart. If you can, if you can really understand what's going on here and here, then yes, you can actually predict where things are going to be a year or five years from now, because those things will be in line 
with with your your dominant thoughts and where your heart is set and and um and will direct your life to a life of abundance from a relationship standpoint or abundance from from a, a interpersonal connection standpoint or or a relationship with your kids or even financially yes and from an 80 20 rule um i love that principle when it comes to time management i really do i i i actually communicate that with with my employees i'll say listen i need you to to get the cars all cleaned but i i'm okay with an 80 20 meaning you can spend 20 minutes on washing it or 15 minutes on washing it, it's just fine because we're going to the ranch. It's going to get dirty again anyway. I don't need you cleaning with the toothbrush because 80% of getting that clean is going to be done in 20% of the time. You spend another three hours on it. Yeah, we're going to have you know every single fly taken out of the, the grill in the front, et cetera. And so, um, so that's how I, I've understood the 80-20 principle is in time management and saying, how can I be most effective in creating a large impact with my time because I only have a certain amount. I've never actually heard it put, as you said, where 20% of the people are going to have 80% of the impact in your life. I would say that even smaller than that, I would say a very, very, very small group of that inner circle for my life are the ones that are 99% of the impact in my soul and my life and my trajectory moving forward is maybe only five or six people. I agree. But such a powerful impact. I, I I agree. And if you ever hear me think, I always say there's, there's a reason why God gave you five digits. All right. Each of those digits stand for something. If you look at a star or the star of David, there's five digits and each of them means something um, to a person's soul and how they connect to the earth. Um, Early on in your conversation, you mentioned Tony Robbins. I am good friends with a guy by the name of Les Browns. So I've met Tony Robbins. I've been in um, um, many uh, arenas with motivational speakers. Um, I had Craig Valentine on as as a guest, an amazing public speaker, uh, first person that ever won as a rookie that won um, Toastmasters National Championship. Um, I know a lot of people that through COVID went into business on their own. How important is it to for a person to read, attend workshops, seminars, speakers, and whatever, um, and learn from experts when you start in your business? Now we're talking about success and growing a business. Absolutely. So um, I was asked many years ago, Paul, when uh, after I become successful in my company, what's the what's the most valuable use of my money? What's the most important thing I should invest in? And my answer is this, the most valuable thing that you can invest in is yourself. I had a mentor years ago that told me, Paul, the most valuable piece of real estate you'll ever own is the six inches between your ears. You develop that, everything else is, is, is op opportunities for you. In fact, something really valuable. Somebody asked me the other day, um, Paul, I would love to be able to get just half an hour with somebody like Tony, you know? And I asked him this, I said, tell me this, what do you think he would tell you in that half an hour that he's not already telling you in his books and his tapes and his seminars? So spending time with Les Brown, oh, that would be beautiful. But guess what? You can buy his tapes, you can go to his seminars and you can get his best material. He's not holding anything back. He's sharing from his heart and he's teaching you things that are transforming for his life and so many others. So that's the reason why, why my mentor early on told me, Paul, your car should be a university on wheels. From now on, I don't even want you to know if your car radio works. There's audio programs and on, on business and leadership and relationships and success that you can just be filling your mind with. So Yes, the most valuable thing you can invest in today is not gold, is not silver, is not real estate, is not crypto. The most valuable thing that you can invest in today is yourself, because no matter where the market goes, that is something that you can expand into beautiful abundance in all areas of your life. Boy, you're just taking my my, my map to, to this uh, um 
uh, for this podcast right in the direction where I wanted to be. And the funny thing is, you, you know, you said about my relationship with um, Les. I actually was his trainer. I saw him five days a week. He was the fastest first black person, uh, person of color to get a morning talk show. And he set a record for the first person to get fired for that morning talk show. I actually <laughs> bought him his own tapes to give to him. I, I was introduced to him as Leslie C. Brown. And I had stayed up, you know, many a nights and I watched this guy that was so charismatic. And I always said, oh, I said that. I wish I can do this. I should have tapes out. And I bought the tapes to give to him and did not realize that I was training the Les Brown. I bought him his own motivational tapes. Uh, and that, that leads me to the one thing that I always say. This is my thing. Um, and it's just for me. Um, when you're starting a business and you can echo this to be true, I mean, you're a lot more successful on the level that you're at, but I think we're on the same level when it says, we say su success on life, and we'll talk about your charity soon. Um, is staying physically and mentally in shape, um, in, is it something that's extremely important in building a business and how you uh, relate and interact with people that work with you and for you? Absolutely, Kevin. In fact, the worst thing that can happen is for you to spend your years and years building a business and finally achieving financial success and then have your health to a point where you can enjoy. In fact, I can't tell you how many people who they have let their, their health go to crap and they would trade anything. They would trade their Lamborghinis and their nice house and all of this stuff they would trade to have that health back again. And so that as you're as you're defining success in your life and you're you you've got to make sure that you take into consideration all the different areas of success and i tell people okay what what does success look for you financially that's a little teeny piece of this pie you look at this pie financial success is only a little piece another piece of the pie is what does your body how, how is your success success from a health standpoint 10, 20 years from now? And then your relationships and then your philanthropy and the, the lives that you're changing and your travel and your time. And all of these are different pieces of the pie that you need to make sure that you have equal balance in all of them because money is only a tool that can help enhance a lot of other things, but it should only be a part of that whole success picture. And health should be number one because you can't travel without your health and you can't drive your nice cars without your health and you can't build a relationship and continue a relationship with your family without your health. All of the other pictures, part pizza, pieces of this pie, are negatively influenced if you don't, if you don't have your health. And I hope whomever's listening to this while you're sitting in Starbucks, that you make you a number one priority. Now I got three more questions to ask you before I ask you your, your ask. What's your relationship with excuses? <laughs> so I had a I had a, uh, a license plate on my car when I was 23 years old that was N-O and the letter X-Q-S-E-S, -E no excuses, because I think that that's the biggest enemy to success in all of those areas is excuses. Excuses and blame, which are kind of the same thing. Blame is one of the most empower disempowering emotions you can have when you are making the excuse that it's so, and it's not just blaming other people, it's blaming circumstances. And those are all excuses. It's, it's a, it's, it's shirking responsibility. The most empowering thing you can do is take responsibility, not only for your future, but take responsibility for your past. Understand that, yes, there were hurt people that caused you pain. There were people out of integrity that took things from you, et cetera. But, but the second that we put the blame on them and use as an excuse, don't beat yourself up. I'm not saying, oh, I'm a horrible person because I should have, should have, could have, would have. Don't should on yourself either. Again, don't should on yourself. That's super important. So don't <laughs> beat, don't beat yourself up for all of this stuff, but take responsibility. Say, you know what? I'm responsible. I 
now knowing what I know now, as I move forward into a place of more success and more healthy relationships, et cetera, I'm going to learn from that. I'm going to take responsibility for my life up to this point and my life moving forward. That is a key to success in every single area in health and relationships and money in time and travel. Every single part of that pie is positively or negatively affected by your decision to take responsibility, to let go of blame and let go of any excuses of why it's not your fault or why you can't move forward. All right. Is um, consistency really the key to success? It's an ingredient. Well said. You know, it's an ingredient. I mean, my 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 wife, uh, Vanessa, she, she, she decided the other day she was going to make uh, homemade bread and she got all the ingredients right. She couldn't find any yeast. And she, she thought that, that, uh, that baking, baking powder would probably do the same thing. And she put it in and, and uh, it was still bread. But it, it didn't work out very well. I think, you know, there's people that are successful that don't have total consistency all the time. But but it helps a lot if you can be the consistent every day. Understand this, though. Nobody is consistent every day. We're all going to fall off the track. We're all going to have a day or a week. We're like, crap, I wasted that whole week and I didn't do anything moving me towards my goals. But you can always get back on track. You can always get consistent again and, and bring those things into your life. That's all right. Paul. In business and in life, how important is a man's word or a woman's word? How what is men's work? How important, be it man or woman or be whatever we 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 label ourselves, how important is a person's word in business and in life? Word. Word. I'm telling you what, if um if you are out of integrity and somebody can't trust what you say and what you do, it will take years to try to rebuild that trust. This is in your relationships is the most important. You know, when you say to your kids, I will be at that ball game, you better be there. You know, stop making excuses. There better be, unless the world burns up between now and then, sticking by your word. If you can't, then stop giving your word to things that you don't know you can fulfill. And, and so in, um, it's so important to under promise and over deliver in your relationships, in your business life, in all areas of your life by, by saying, okay, because my word is so important, for me to say, I'm going to be there at this time, or you're going to get this return, or I'm going to be this, whatever it is, you say you try to build that up just to build yourself up and try to convince people of something, that will come back to bite you every single time. Under promise and over deliver. Make sure that you're a man or woman of your word in every part of your communication because trust, the speed of trust in building a business, in building a life, in building a relationship, is everything. All right, Paul, one more time. How do people get in touch with you? You you said so much and you you you've given so much great information. We know your heart now. Um we're going to wrap up this, but I want to talk about your charities and I want to talk about the conversation you had that the things you you want to do going forward, you want to impact humanity and the world. You want to be the change to be and you're going to be the example. We're going to talk about that, and then we're going to wrap it up, and I'll ask you about your ask. How do people get in touch with you? Again, you can uh, follow me on social media, Paul Hutchinson Official. There's no G in Hutchinson, Paul, H-U-T-C-H-I-N-S-O-N, paulhutchinsonofficial.com, uh, or you can Facebook or LinkedIn, et cetera. Uh, but somebody told me on an earlier podcast, Paul, you need something simpler. So last night, I bought the domain soulhealer007.com. And you click on that and it'll take you right into my my uh, Facebook. You can follow me there. Again, I don't have, I only have like a thousand followers on my Facebook because I only opened it up 
um, in in the last few weeks because of some of the the charity work that I've been doing. Um, but um, but yeah, I would love to, and if 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 and follow me, I have a lot of beautiful information uh, coming out that can help people truly heal from childhood trauma, from things that are holding them back, success principles, things that we're talking about here, uh, I, and 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 links. I would love the link to this podcast so that I can promote it. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm going to give you that, and and I'm going to give you a little food for thought. I'm going to uh, the students going to give the the teacher, uh, and I say this all all the time with my group of people. And when I started my business, everyone was giving me advice and I took it, um, the advice. I spent $10,000 on marketing and media. And I want to tell everyone, anyone to sell in marketing and me- media, I'll show you in one one page how to market your, your pro- product and grow it. I gave $10,000 as a donation to a marketing and media company and got no return on my investment. If they can't guarantee you a return on your investment, all you're doing is making a donation to their dinner plans, their travel plans, to their kids' tuition, or whatever they're wasting, wasting their money on. Um, but I had to stay true to my heart. I said, you know, I'm surrounded by a very unique group of people. If someone calls me, George Lee calls me, he's a famous film producer in Hollywood, and he asked me he needs something, I'll drop everything and I'll do it. If I need George, George would do the same thing. You know, our 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 ongoing thing is basically... If you call and ask, we will deliver. Just don't hurt us. Now, if you hurt us, there's a whole different conversation that comes about it. You need quality people to follow you, people that have a higher call to action, people that will produce without asking to to do the work. And that's what you need. Don't look for large numbers because that's a waste of time. That's called a mob. And mobs don't normally destroy something. They don't build. Every single company that has ever been built has been built by a small group of people that have a greater vision than everyone else. And then they find people to share that vision or like-minded people. So, uh, Paul, your charities. You know, one of the things that um, empowered me to do this interview is because you're giving back. Not because of how successful you are. I can care less. You know, when we all die, none of that goes with us. So I'm not impressed. But what impressed me is that, you know, hope, helping other people every day. We share uh, a like-minded mindset. Our mission is driven to to help people, to empower. I don't know if our politics line up, but I do know we support humanity and providing opportunities for everyone. But the big thing is, you know, I'm going to tell my guests, do not call Paul nor me. And I wish you would quit calling me and asking me for money. If you're not helping yourself, I can't help you. So please don't do it to my friend and ask Paul for a loan to finance this dream or whatever. You've got to do the hard work first. Get dirty, lose some sleep, you know, sacrifice something, sleep on your mom's couch, live in your car or whatever the case may be. Rebuild your your, your life before you ask for help, you know. We don't mind helping you out, but we're not going to haul you around for the rest of your life. So don't expect it. But this man is giving back. So let's talk about your charities, um, of what you're, what, what you're connected to and how we can help you and support you, Paul. Thank you, Kevin. So I'm the, the founder of the Child Liberation Foundation. You can go to liberateachild.org or liberatechildren.org, uh, which fights to eradicate child trafficking. And um and I'll tell you this, you know, I'm the, I'm the founder of a very large company, but I put a whole bunch of partners in there and I'm not nearly as rich as everybody thinks, you know, we're selling the homes. So people for years are like, oh, I don't need to donate to that charity. Paul's got it all covered. Uh, it's not about that. It's about the blessings that you get in your life by helping other people. And I've, I've, uh, we've, we've trans transferred a little bit in our focus of the foundation in realizing that. Our goal is not just to rescue a 10-year-old out of the clutches of a trafficker in Honduras, which we've been doing for the last number of years. I've been doing for over 10 years. But our goal is to help rescue the 10-year-old inside of a of a heart of a, a 30, 40-year-old man or woman. And so um, by the, the biggest ask that I have, if you want to donate to the foundation, great. My biggest ask is connect me with more people like Kevin. I love sharing my heart, my life, my purpose moving forward. If you have connections with other podcasts, that would be great uh, stages, places that I can share. In fact, Kevin, I'm from an ask for you. I'll just tell you this. I love Les Brown 
And if you're the one that taught him how to talk from the heart like he does, I would absolutely love to find an hour of your time on the phone just so you can kind of coach me because I'm brand new at this. I'm not a speaker. I'm not any of those things. But I feel this calling to share from the heart in ways that can truly transform lives. And I believe that I can. I've listened to Les Brown so many times. I have half his stuff memorized. I mean, yeah. I could I, word for word in his tone. I absolutely love the message and the energy behind that man because he's speaking from the heart. And that's where I want to take my life. I want to shed all of this crap and I want to be on the road. I want to speak. I want to share. I want to inspire people to transform their lives, to step forward in a place where success is not just money, success in their relationships and their, their, their marriages and with their kids and their health and everything else. That is exactly the direction that I want to go. Well, I, I, I will do this and I'm going to make a correction in, in your statement. I coach Les Brown as his fitness coach. I'm a prof fitness professional okay. for 40 years. I'm a three time um, published author and award winning author. Um, Mike Jackson um, uh, was Les's uh, partner in helping him build the, the Les Brown Foundation in coaching. I've learned a lot from from both of those people. Um, the one thing that um, I learned from Les is that um, to be authentic, to be true to yourself. You know, uh, Les asked me when I, you know, when I did his show, you know, what made me different from any other motivational speaker and whatever. And I said, I'm not a um, motivational speaker. I don't aspire to be a motivational speaker. I said, what I am, I'm a game, game changer. You know, the reason why I wrote my book is because, you know, the things that most of you do when you um speak to people in, in in groups the reality is is that when i do my speaking it could be 300 people it could be 1500 people it could be 15000 people i only know that 1% of those people are going to walk away and and take the tools and the information i gave them and do something with it and less than 1% of those people after 90 days are going to go back to the regular life and it's just that one person is going to go through and change their life so when I speak to anyone, what makes me different? I speak to one person at a time. I change one life at a time. I impact one person at a time. All right. And that's how things get done. One person at a time, just like you and I are doing this right now. We're sharing with people, you know, the roadmap to achieve, achieving happiness and success. And if you were to summarize this whole interview as being true to yourself and being kind to other people. And that's the reason why I have you know, my good friend on here, Paul Hutchison, to share this with you. And as Paul asked before, you know, is how do you get things done? You connect your resources with other people's resources. So share um, this video, share the conversation, write a comment, reach out to Paul. If you're a podcaster and you want to have Paul on your, your show, please be someone that's giving back. Don't don't ask Paul in order just to run up your numbers, whatever. That's not the type of guy he is. You know, listen to his ask. And, and Paul, we will speak um, afterwards and we will talk about how to, you know, to, to do these interviews because sometimes people are not prepared. I'm one of those people. I'm over prepared. I had a plan for this. So if you look at the roadmap to success in building a business, um, I have a business that I'm successful with in my heart. I have, I'm um, going to learn something from Paul. I've learned a lot to, um, from today. So, um, Paul, do you want to leave anything to our listeners? I want to say one more thing to them before um, I'll sign off. I, uh, I'm super grateful for this opportunity to share. I'm super grateful for your leading through this interview. So it wasn't the same memorized, whatever you got deep down and asked questions to, to, to help really identify where my heart is and, and that, the, the things that I didn't even think about on my road to success. So super grateful for your way of doing this interview and, and managing the process on the way through. And the one thing that I, I want to lead uh, to leave with is choose today to lead from the heart to have all of your decisions in your relationships in your business and everything 
live with integrity, lead from the heart, understand that whatever happened in the past is the past and you can let it go. You can let go of things that had happened to you, things that people said to you. You're carrying that trauma by choice today by reiterating it in your head. Let it go, learn forgiveness, learn to forgive yourself, learn to forgive others and learn how to step forward into a new life that is filled with abundance of love and progression and success in ways that you could never have while you were still holding on to that trauma of your past. And with that said, um, Paul Hutchison, my friend, um, student of life, um, warrior of the great one, um, you're a disciple. And thank you for being uh, an honored guest on the show. We have covered so much information, and we hope that at some point this episode um, you would like to share, if it's enlightened you, if it's touched you in any type of way, or when you look out your window or look into the eyes of someone else, hopefully this conversation has changed your view, not only for what, how you see yourself, but how you relate to humanity. If you like what you've heard today, please go to RMK Productions and Network and subscribe and follow. If you really like to be a person of higher call to action, share this episode as many times as you possible. If you're a podcaster and would like to um, have Paul on your your show, give me a call or reach out to Paul directly and I will con connect you. Um, go to rmkproductions.org um, in order to reach us or send us an email to info at rmkproductions.org. We appreciate you, and Paul, you are always welcome back. If you need help, direction, you need a good editor for your book, um, I have my own publishing uh, label. We'll be more than happy to help you. It won't cost you a dime. Um, and please, if you have friends that would like to, um, if they're giving back to the community, that's all we're, we're about, please refer them to this podcast. We'll be more than happy to have them on, on as a guest. So with that said, I want to thank everyone for tuning in and listening in and sharing. We would appreciate you all. As my grandfather said early on in my life, when you get to a point in life that you can help someone else, it is your duty to do so. Reach one, teach one, and we'll fade to black. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen.